Okay, so we're going to move into the spinal region part of the motor system. So we said earlier, let me get to the right page. There we go. So we said earlier that movements are generated when we combine um, somatosensory information, networks of spinal interneurons, and descending motor commands, and they all interact in the spinal cord to elicit, elicit motor neuron firing. So um, the spinal cord mechanisms that organize and synchronize muscle contractions include reciprocal inhibition, muscle synergies, proprioceptive input from the Golgi tendon organs and things like that, and stepping pattern generators. So um, all of those things are neural communications within the spinal cord that contribute to that coordination of movement. So reciprocal inhibition is the inhibition of antagonist muscles during agonist contractions. And it's achieved by interneurons in the spinal cord that link motor neurons into functional groups. So when a muscle contracts, the muscle spindles within that muscle send signals into the spinal cord that activate interneurons that inhibit the motor neurons of the antagonist. So this process is used a lot during um, voluntary motion to prevent antagonist opposition to the movement. So it's the example of um, when you're trying to contract your quadriceps, um, you have to inhibit the hamstrings in order to not prevent that movement. Obviously, in co-contraction that we talked about earlier, this isn't happening. So there's a lot of coordination that has to involve with that. So when, um, without a mechanism to inhibit those opposing muscles, then you are going to get co-contraction. So the, when the muscle contracts, the muscle spindles um, that send signals to the spinal cord that activate the neurons, they are the same ones that inhibit the motor neurons of the antagonist. And it also prevents activation of antagonist muscles when um, an agonist is reflexively activated. So it's not a voluntary movement. Um, muscle synergies, they are, it's coordinated muscle action. So we use muscle synergies all the time. When we eat, we need finger flexion and elbow flexion, combining with supination of the forearm to bring the food to our mouth. Um, so there are um, spinal interneurons that are excited by type 2 afferents projecting to the muscle, the motor neurons of muscles acting at other joints. So we're getting feedback all the time, and there's that feedback, feed forward, that is helping to control our movements. So um, a lot of times, normal muscle synergies are um, activities of muscles that are activated together in a normal nervous system. We will also talk about abnormal muscle synergies, which is a uh, different type of thing. So, and usually abnormal muscle synergies involve upper motor neurons. The normal muscle synergies involve lower motor neurons. So a lot of times you'll hear in the clinic muscle synergies as referred to the abnormal ones. Um, but right here we're talking about normal muscle synergies that um, act together to produce function. So the spinal cord creates a complete proprioceptive model of the body that's called a schema. Um, using information um, in the background, it's non-conscious, um, we use the, the information from the spindle receptors, the Golgi tendon organs, all that proprioceptive input to generate this body schema, and that body schema is used to plan and adapt movements. So. The example that they give in the book is that you're trying to hit a tennis ball and you have to know the initial position of the arm um, to plan whether to move the racket hand up or down. Um, all of the information from those joint capsule and ligament receptors, muscle spindle receptors, Golgi tendon organs, provide that proprioceptive input required to generate the body schema. So when we're doing the testing like we did in Tests and Measures Lab last summer, where you say, is your um, arm up or down, is your finger up or down, 
the um, spinal cord has to kind of check that body schema, check all the information that's being collected from um, all those receptors and make that decision. So Golgi tendon organs contribute to proprioception by registering tendon tension. So that's kind of telling us what position are we in. Um, the role of Golgi tendon organs in movement is to adjust muscle contraction. And the effect of um, Golgi tendon organ input by itself is not powerful enough to inhibit voluntary muscle contraction, but it's doing a lot of adjustment in those involuntary postural movements. So um, there's really interesting um, effect in the spinal cord that's called a stepping pattern generator. Um, and it's basically networks of spinal interneurons that um, activate motor neurons to elicit alternating flexion and extension of the hips and the knees. So it's that stepping, um, stepping pattern. Um, each lower limb has a dedicated stepping pattern generator in the spinal cord. Um, afferent input adjusts timing, facilitate transition from stance to swing phase of gait, and reinforces muscle activation. So a lot of times when we're working people uh, with people in gait training um, in the clinic or in the lab, we're having to retrain these stepping pattern generators, um, which is pretty interesting, <laughs> I think. So I work with a lot of people on gait because I'm working with people with Parkinson's. And um, gait changes considerably in Parkinson's. And so um, I'm always amazed by this. And it's like I have all my little experimental subjects coming in, and uh, it benefits them as well. So um, I just love working on gait with people. It's pretty neat. Um, most movement is either automatic or voluntary or anticipatory. So. The spinal reflexes do a lot in that um, automatic or voluntary movement. When we um, examine reflex in the clinic, it provides information about the peripheral and the central nervous system. Um, the spinal region reflexes can actually operate without brain input. So a lot of those automatic movements, it doesn't even have to bother the brain with that. The spinal cord can handle it. So um, when we did reflex testing, and I've got to say, I don't do a lot of reflex testing in the clinic. Um, and it's one of those things that it can tell you um, a lot of information. But if you're not very good at it, it can tell you a lot of false information. So if you're going to be using um, reflex testing a lot in the clinic, that is a really good thing to practice on a regular basis. Um, normally, it's done in the initial evaluation, which, of course, is PTAs. We don't do. Um, but it can give you some good information, so it's a skill worth working on. Um, the phasic stretch reflex from the muscle spindles, it's a muscle contraction in response to a quick stretch. So when we're testing reflexes with a um, reflex hammer, like the patellar tendon reflex, this is what we're, we're doing. The quick stretch by hitting the tendon with the uh, mallet um, activates the signals from muscle spindles to alpha motor neurons in the same muscle. So we get that quick stretch and we get the response from it. Um, the cutaneous reflex is a withdrawal reflex. Um, cutaneous stimulation can um, elicit reflexive movements and the circuitry responsible for the withdrawal uh, reflex is located within the spinal cord. So if you um, touch a hot surface you withdraw right away, or if something's painful, you withdraw that limb right away. It doesn't have to go to the brain, it can just ha all happen in the spinal cord. So the relationship between reflexive and voluntary movement, um, arousal changes the level of descending input to the spinal circuitry. So the muscle spindle output is modified by sensitivity adjustments and recent movements and contractions that the muscle has undergone. So muscle spindle output is not linearly related to changes in muscle length or the rate of change of length. There's a lot of other input that goes into it. So you can have um, higher sensitivity if you've just done some recent movements. So for people who are athletes um, or 
you know, I think probably, I hope, most of us participate in regular physical activities, um, you, you do find that when you've been doing an activity, it becomes easier. It's not all, you don't have to plan the activity for each time you do it. So, um, so we have this relationship between the reflexive and voluntary movement that kind of helps us um, do continuing movements. So it used to be it used to be thought that reflexes were responses to particular types of sensory information and and um, excited only specific pathways, but now we know that it's far more complex than that.